Good evening, leading on BCN News Bulletin for tonight. Yesterday morning's Legislative Assembly was a bit challenging as the leader of the country was absent, causing much debate and concern by the opposition as to why the Premier called a meeting without intention of being present. Speaker of the House Honourable Ahiva Levy advised continuation, calling on the opposition to maintain meeting protocols with the eligible quorum to continue the meeting. However, a lengthy and heated discussion on the first submitted motion by Alofi North MP Honourable Vainga Tukutonga that no member of the new Legislative Assembly or Cabinet can trespass and remove assets from government departments without prior permission brought many views and interpretations of the Constitution, Code of Ethics and standing orders by members of Parliament. Even though great support was shown by members of the opposition, the motion was defeated 5 to 9. The second motion by Honourable Tukutonga was also defeated. Member of Parliament for Mutalo, Honourable Bill Mutfo, submitted two motions. First, to consider broadcasting on Sunday, that motion was defeated. The second motion by Honourable Mutfo to remove TV licence fees for watching TV Niwe, that motion was passed in the House. The last motion on the business paper yesterday from Commonwealth Member Honourable Krosita Tui for the government to subsidise retail prices of agricultural products like feed and fishing equipment to encourage more family participation in sustainable food security activities. That motion was amended, so instead of subsidies, retail prices for government to review retail prices. Of course, the motions that were passed in the House will need consideration from Cabinet before endorsement. A long-standing issue with asbestos on the island is about to change after a proposal to bury asbestos on the island was endorsed by Cabinet. Work is about to begin with an awareness campaign for village councils and the public next week. According to the department responsible for the removal of asbestos or the necessary exploration into the most secure and efficient disposal of the toxic product has been taken and the department will progress to the awareness campaign next week with assistance from New Zealand. New Zealand High Commissioner His Excellency Mark Plomsky said New Zealand is very happy to assist with NUI's development and NUI government has good leadership to progress to the next stage of addressing the asbestos issue. He also said there are ongoing discussions with funding that will also include asbestos still on some properties. With many concerned residents applauding the move to rid of this asbestos, there are still questions of the security and safety of the underground water lanes if toxic waste is buried on the island. Niwe is fighting to get loan artworks that have been missing for more than a decade returned to the island. The two art pieces by Corin Cross and Sally Jessup are considered to be culturally significant as Niwe does not have much in terms of artworks. The two art pieces were loaned to a San Francisco Pacific Visual Arts exhibit in 2001. The artists say that they were sent to a prominent Tongan scholar, poet and community leader based in the U.S. by the name of Fuifui Lupin Niume Tolu. Numerous attempts by the artists to have the art pieces returned had been in vain and the new government has also tried writing to Niume Tolu without success. Ms. Corin Cross's family have said that they have made several attempts and offers to pay for shipping costs in the past few years, even arranging to go and collect the pieces in America, but received excuses and the art pieces have still not been returned. However, following a One News investigative piece last week, New Tolu has responded saying that she does not have that she does have access to Cross's artwork and is happy to send it back if the pa family pays the shipping costs. Now the families and artists are hoping that after such a long time, these intellectual properties and artworks will be returned to their rightful owners. Niue has been dubbed the Rock of Polynesia due to its format, and geographically many around the world refer to the island as the highest raised coral atoll, and it was no surpri not surprising that a marine scientist decided to visit our shores. Dr. Teni Topalian, who has travelled the world researching some of nature's most spectacular coral reefs formations, eventually stopped in Niue. Today we caught up with Dr. Topalian about her fascination with coral and why we on the island should be more aware. 
when you go snorkeling or when you go scuba diving or do underwater photography, whatever, it's important to just observe, to look, to not touch or walk on the coral, to not break the coral, you know, for a souvenir or whatever. And of course, you have to have tourism as well. Tell your guests and your visitors uh, as such. Because um, even though corals have very um, hard skeletons made of calcium carbonate, but they're also fragile ecosystems. So you have to be careful uh, not to do things that will uh, increase their chances of getting a coral disease or eventually dying. Because corals do grow back, but they grow back very slowly. And the conditions necessary for growth have to be, uh, you know, really good. For example, the right salinity, the right water temperature, the, the right water depth, the clarity. You always need clean, clear waters because if you have turbid waters, dirty, muddy, murky waters, that inhibits coral growth. So taking all that into account, even any human activity on land will affect your coral reefs eventually runoff, sedimentation, you know, all those things will uh, inhibit coral growth. Mm. Coral polyp is uh, an animal. It's a living thing. And within the animal, there's also uh, tiny unicellular algae, plants called zooxanthellae that are in the coral polyp. So it is very much a living thing. Uh, and it's important for people to, to realize that they reproduce, uh, they obtain nutrition, uh, they have different growth patterns, and of course, different corals uh, grow at different rates. I think it's important, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that your departments of environment, fisheries, their education, they're all doing it already. Dr. Topalian also said there needs to be more awareness and education of how important it is for coral conservation. The coral reefs are invaluable. Um, they are in the open sea, it's not as productive as a coral reef. Coral reefs are the most productive, most complex, and most diverse ecosystems in the world other than the tropical rainforests of the world. You cannot even put a, a monetary amount because as I said, they are invaluable. Why are they important? Well, besides, like you said, its beauty, the aesthetics, which it is, all the different shapes and colors of the corals, the reef fish, it's beautiful. But it's important for your economy, for island nations. Uh, if you want tourism, if you want people to go snorkeling and diving and do underwater photography when they come, well, they need to see beautiful, healthy coral reefs. I don't think they'll be too happy if they see dead reefs everywhere, you know? So it's important for your economy. Uh, we have found out through research that certain antibiotics and other medicinal uses from some of the coral animals living and further research has to be done in the reefs. I don't want to go into detail as to which antibiotic and, and so forth, but it is for medicinal uses. Uh, it is important traditionally, culturally. I can't imagine uh, islanders living on an island with no coral reefs. Um, it's important, of course, in terms of a source of uh, food, a source of protein. The, the fish that you are eating is very, very healthy, you know, and, and you can obtain fresh fish all the time. You know, subsistence fishing, subsistence farming is very, very important to islanders. Um, so it's, as I said, it's important from an ecological point of view, an aesthetic point of view, uh, economic point of view, uh, and of course, an educational and scientific point of view. Your coral reefs are natural laboratories, you know, for you to take your young people, your youth, your students, uh, whoever's interested to, to go and, and to see and to observe and to study. So that's why I said they're, they're also important for educational and scientific purposes. And there's still a lot that we don't know about coral reefs. Because yes, there are quite a few coral reef ecologists, but when you think that there are about 124 countries that have reefs and the number of marine biologists that are studying in tropical areas, there aren't that many. So there's a need for further scientific study. Uh, and there's a need for more marine protected areas. There's a need for you know good marine resource management plans, uh, policies, regulations. All these things are, are very, very important.
Dr. Tapalian is hoping to continue her educational awareness of coral importance and generations whilst here on the island. Today marks World Mother Tongue Day, celebrated on the 21st of February each year since 2000. The focus of the day is to promote the preservation and protection of all languages used by the people of the world, with this year's theme focusing on mother tongue instruction and inclusive education. Languages are the most powerful instruments of preserving and developing tangible and intangible heritage. Wangahoniwe is among some of the world's languages deemed as near extinction with less than 5,000 fluent speakers. Studies have found that in order for a native language to survive, it needs at least 5,000 fluent speakers. This will be a challenge not only for institutions such as education or Taonganiwe, but for the Niwean people to promote and practice the use of Wangahoniwe that is on dire straits. World Mother Tongue Day promotes all moves for the preservation of languages to ensure linguistic diversity and multilingual education. Last Saturday marked the second round of local cricket competition made for interesting competition and watching for spectators. But the preliminary scores from the games show that Makefu met their competition in the team from Liku. Makefu was first up to bat with a total of 291 points, beating Liku by a slim margin. Liku had a total of 286 points with six people left to bat. At this point, it is uncertain who won this match until the committee meets this week. Waiya was the pitch for the competition between Mutalo and Tamgotonga. Mutalo was up to bat first, only managing 251 points. Tamgotonga spent most of the afternoon batting to catch up to the score, but succumbed to Mutalo's fielding prowess. The combined team of Toi Hiktavake were up against tough competition with La Kappa. Toi Hiktavake was first up to bat, managing the bare minimum of 15 batters, with a total point score of 165. La Kappa claimed victory, taking one hour to catch up to that score. Tuapa succumbed to the might of Hakupu. Hakupu bat first with 294. Tuapa managed to get 258 runs with one man still standing by the end of the allotted time. Neighbours Avaseli and Uwaya battled it out, but it was Avaseli who came out on top with 358 points and 21 batters out. Uwaya was up to bat next, managing 202 points, 18 batters. The Kikiki committee and team management are due to meet this week for team briefings and finalising scores. And those are our news stories for this evening. We do hope that you can join us again for our next news bulletin on Thursday.